Man, it's not that they looked that good, it's that they looked that good without Matthews. I choose to believe Matthews actually did play in that game because my doctor said it reduces stress. Let's go! Ladies and gentlemen, oh. it's a little ridiculous. Good boy. Play all the hits! Left Toronto Maple Leafs. Let me finish. How much more to go to bed after watching that? I'm quite hyped. With you wherever you are, welcome to LFR. I decided I wanted to wear the blue one after all. Continuity errors for the win. Leafs win! 4-2 over the New York Islanders. And again, again, I don't know when the tides turned, but the Leafs, again, with a relatively peaceful affair against the New York Islanders. Dude, when Tavares first signed here, every Leafs Islanders meeting was a Metallica concert. But then at some point this flipped to switch that even when the Islanders were, admittedly, the better team, or at very least, they made it deeper into the playoffs, the Leafs just kinda handled them. They got shut out by Michael Hutchinson, they got shut out by Joseph Wool, and in this one, they were losing the entire third period, and they got caved in the entire third period by the Leafs. And the Leafs didn't even have Matthews in this game. Two Leafs forwards played over 20 minutes in this one. John Tavares, just under 21 and a half though, leading the bunch. And worthy of mention on the second half of a back-to-back. -back. And Islanders fans, if you're watching, I, I think I know why. Did you watch the Leafs play the Sens? Did you watch the Leafs play the Sabres, hmm? Did you watch either Leafs versus Coyotes game? Well, if you had seen any of those games, you would know the biggest mistake the Islanders have made against the Toronto Maple Leafs. The New York Islanders are just not bad enough. No, the Islanders are just sort of, you know, they're just missing the playoffs. Like, they're not awful, they're just missing the playoffs. That's not a dig, by the way. Not every team can miss the playoffs, and the Islanders have been playing at roughly a playoff rate ever since they actually had, like, you know, a home building to play in. But they're just kind of there, they're just kind of average, and the Leafs tend to do well against average teams. The Leafs tend to do well against good teams. No, no, it's the bad ones who will get you. So. Let's talk about this game. Anyway, let's talk about this game. First and foremost, there was a fight between Wayne Simmons and Ross Johnston because first shift, Ross Johnston runs over Mark Giordano. And obviously with all due respect to Mark Giordano, he just scored the overtime winner last night. You could tell he wasn't ready. Like a big part of the conversation with the Leafs recently is you can tell when they're dialed and when they're not. In a way, Ross Johnston kind of screwed it up for the Islanders because from the first shift on, he was like, no, you kind of have to try tonight. So as a result, the Leafs were like, okay, fine. And they beat them. If you just left them alone, you might've been fine. But as a result of that hit, Wayne Simmons challenges Ross Johnston to a fight. Now. Was it much of a fight? No. Did Ross Johnston win? Sure. I There were like four punches total, and one of them was while Simmons was down, I, but it was more like one of those follow-through punches. I'm not going to call Ross Johnston a villain here. But I'm sure Islanders fans will admit it wasn't much of a fight. But I wanted to highlight Wayne Simmons because he is truly nuts for taking that fight. This is how tough this dude is. Because you think about the toughest names in the NHL, I think Wayne Simmons is still up there. The term heavyweight in the NHL has definitely changed over the years, but in terms of the toughest guys who will fight in the NHL, his name is in a certain tier. And that tier is either at the top or near the top. So Wayne Simmons, oh, heavyweight in the NHL. Here's the thing, no he's super not. He has got heavyweight toughness and stubbornness and borderline foolishness. Dude, he gave up 52 pounds. Let me, let me say that again. He gave up 52 pounds in that fight with Ross Johnston. Ross Johnston is listed at 232 pounds. Simmons is listed at 180. For reference, Mitch Marner is listed at 172. So a dude who's eight pounds heavier than Mitch Marner is fighting Ross Johnston. In recent memory alone, Wayne Simmons has tried to fight Tom Wilson, who is 220 pounds, and got a misconduct for chirping with Patrick Maroon, who is 238. He is heavier than Ross Johnston. And I tweeted this and a bunch of people were like, no, I, si I simply don't believe you. Do believe it. Ask any Flyers fan, Devils fan, Preds fan, briefly Sabres fans, remember that? It was like eight games. Ask anyone who Wayne Simmons has played for, he's always been on the lighter side. Basically, if someone who was the same weight as Wayne Simmons fought the people who Wayne Simmons actually fights and it wasn't Wayne Simmons, 
you would assume they were about to end up as a stain on the ice. Basically, if 99% of 180 pound players in the National Hockey League fought the players who Wayne Simmons tries to fight, they'd you'd be like, oh, you're you're nuts. You're absolutely out of your mind. You need to be escorted out of the building immediately. But because it's Wayne Simmons, you look at the person who has 30, 40, 50 pounds on them and you're like, oh, you're an idiot. You're opening that door? Why would you open that door? No, obviously that doesn't apply with Ross Johnston. He's he's in a pretty extreme case. He's one of the heaviest players in the National Hockey League, but I wanted to highlight that because Wayne Simmons is willing to go anybody and he gives up weight in almost every fight he takes or has ever been in. Like Wayne Simmons gives up 34 pounds to Kyle Clifford. To put the Ross Johnston versus Wayne Simmons fight into UFC terms, it's like a light heavyweight before weight cut taking on like a welterweight before weight cut. So like Glover Teixeira taking on Kumaro Usman. Dude, this guy's tough as nails. This one blew my mind. 34 different skaters have skated for the Toronto Maple Leafs this season. Wayne Simmons only outweighs seven of them. Go look at it, it's on NHL.com. I couldn't believe the names. Kerfoot by a pound, Alex Steves, Bunting, Kasha? Blackwell? Co Colin Blackwell! Colin Actual Blackwell! What chunk of the people watching this video are taller than Colin Blackwell? That is, that is silly. All that to say we should all appreciate what Wayne Simmons brings to the table, which is complete reckless abandon. I'm sorry, that's one of the toughest guys in the league by default. I don't even care what happened in the fight. Anyway, yeah, the score. So, I had a tweet that uh, I shouldn't have, because the Islanders scored on the power play, Nathan Beauvillier, he shot it and scored because he had a lot of net to shoot at. And what I tweeted was, Jack Buddy! And this, by the way, is the reason I tweeted Jack Buddy. Now, you might notice there's a couple really dumb things about this photo. Number one is the amount of net. There is a wild amount of net for Beauvillier, who is not bad at hockey, to shoot at. Number two, Jack Campbell and Ilya Labushkin look like the same person. That is how much Ilya Labushkin is in his way. To me, I think there's two people in the wrong here. There's two people not doing their jobs as well as they could be here. Now, if you want to rank them, you probably give it to Labushkin, because that is a legendary screen. But also, I think it's perfectly fair to say that because of the screen, perhaps, fine, Campbell loses his post. He absolutely does. And you can't, you, look at the photo. You can't say he doesn't. He doesn't think, he would never do this on purpose. Now, instead of saying that, I should have perhaps said this from Nick Richard, or Richard, we haven't met. Jack lost his net trying to see through the screen. Beauvillier had the entire far side. And if I had simply said that, no one would have yelled. Every time I tweet, I'm like, do I have another outlet that I could do this on? No, no, I must tweet it immediately. And then I regret it, and then I tell you about it. And a big chunk of you are like, I, I know, I was there. It was dumb at the time, and now it's dumber now that you said it out loud. All right, fine, don't yell at me! Anyway, it's one nothing Isles. But, just three minutes later, the Leafs, uh, first line without their first line center. I don't, I don't even know if these guys were out there together on purpose. Michael Bunting is out there, but ever since his overtime winner, Mark Giordano continues to cosplay as a forward, and I gotta say, it's working for me. And it almost worked here, it didn't, but Mitch Marner got the rebound, his... 34th of the season ties it up at one heading into intermission. Now, there were a few records tonight. The Leafs get their 50th win of the season. We talked about that. On the broadcast, they mentioned that with this goal, Mitch Marner hits 94 points, which ties his career best. I don't think we're appreciating just how great of a goal scorer Mitch Marner has been this season, especially since January 1st. With his 34th of the season, Marner needs three goals to catch Phil Kessel's Leaf high. Remembering... Phil Kessel never missed a game. Marner missed games this season. William Nylander's career high as a member of the Leafs is not even 34 goals. Although it might be by the end of the season because he matched his career high tonight. You know who else had a couple 32 goal seasons but he never hit 34? Nazem Kadri. And I'm definitely not saying this to disparage Kessel or Nylander or Kadri. I'm doing it to big up Marner. It's crazy. I never would have had Mitch Marner being the number two goal scoring threat on this team. On a team with sniper 
sleepers like William Nylander and John Tavares. There was a time earlier in the season where Mitch Marner didn't look like the second best goal scoring option on his line. By the time this season is said and done, he might flirt with 40 and by the time next season rolls around, they might be going steady. Second period starts and well, it, it might as well have not started. Puck is bouncing around and Alexander Kerfoot, well, the, the best thing you can say is there were six goals in this game and the Leafs scored five of them. Kerfoot trying to clear the puck out of danger, <laughs> whacks it in past Jack Campbell, who really only gave up one goal tonight. I feel like, should own goals count against a goaltender's stats? That feels dumb, right? If you watch Steve Zang, it's you'll remember from a few years ago, the Devils once scored three own goals in the same game, and that affects the goalie's save percentage. Why? What was Jack supposed to be ready for Kerfoot's shot? He hasn't had to worry about Kerfoot's shot since he was with the LA Kings. That doesn't seem any fair, and you know what else doesn't seem fair? The fact that there have only been three goals in this game so far. The Leafs have scored two of them, and they're losing! But halfway through the period, oh, Alexander Kerfoot makes up for it, buddy. Justin Hall underratedly playing in his 200th career NHL game in this one, which is amazing considering he had to I was about to say play from Mike Babcock. He had to sit in a suit and eat popcorn from Mike Babcock. A lot of people get on Justin Hall, including me, but it's amazing how well his career has turned out considering <laughs> Babcock didn't play him. He was a hockey player that wasn't allowed to play hockey. Kudos to the Leafs staff for keeping him around. I, I saw that he was like pegged to be in the lineup one season and I'm like, why? What do you think he's good at hockey? How would you even know? He never played. 200. Now two things happen to Justin Hall's pass. One, it goes off one of the New York Islanders skates and perfectly onto the tape of Alexander Kerfoot. And I think that might have happened because two, they were way too worried about William Nylander. And that is, uh, that's some bad counting right there. On the two on one, Kerfoot just, eh, just, he doesn't slam on the brakes, but he does tap them. He did a little brake check. And it was just enough to get Pellick's stick out of the lane, and I mean, that's as easy a goal as Pierre Engvall is ever going to have in front of him. And I encourage you all to go back and watch that goal because of two things. Number one, I love when Alexander Kerfoot and Pierre Engvall hook up for goals. It doesn't always happen, but when it does, they were usually flying in, so they hug behind the net, and that's hilarious because it always looks like take your kid to work day. You are the world's most massive giraffe with the largest helmet in the history of hockey. I cannot believe Pierre Engvall is a Leaf and exists. Number two, if you watch really closely, the third man in is William Nylander. If you watch really closely, this is when William Nylander headbutts Alexander Kerfoot right in the face and it kind of looked like it hurt a bit. They at very least clunked visors and because Kerfoot seemed fine afterwards, this is very funny to me. Two and a half minutes later, Leafs on the power play. Everyone's starting to get a little antsy. This Leafs power play hasn't scored in a while and I know they're ranked first in the league, but the playoffs after in a couple weeks! And all Morgan Riley falls down, but somehow it actually works. Tavares gets it to Nylander, who just rips it past Ilya Sorokin, which is no small thing. Like, Sorokin has put a really under the radar season out there. I mean, anyone who's been paying attention has been like, holy moly, this goalie's pretty good. But the Islanders, they just... No one in the East who's not currently in a playoff spot has been a factor in the playoff race in the East since like Christmas. So there have been a lot of individual performances on teams that aren't going to make the playoffs that have sort of gone underappreciated and under the radar because their team's not going to make the playoffs. Dude, Sorokin's been solid. I, man, I picked the Islanders to win the Metro. It obviously has not worked out. That way, I I would not bet on them missing the playoffs next year. Sorokin's a big part of that. Now, outside of that, Jack Campbell had to make one amazing save. Well, one, one or two. But what do I say is a good game for a goalie? You don't got to stand in your head. What's a good game for a goalie? What do you need out of your goalie? Don't allow any dumb ones and give your team one or two they don't really deserve. For Jack Campbell, at worst, the first two goals are a wash at worst. But in the third period, even though the Leafs outshot the Islanders 16 to nine, in part due to a five on three power play, Campbell had to come up big. And the Leafs, not for the first time in recent memory, entered the third with a three two lead and win the game. But not before David Kampf scores an empty netter for his 10th of the season. Kampf had one goal last year and the Leafs put a zero on it. I'm not saying the Toronto Maple Leafs are the best offensive team in NHL history. I am, however, saying that they have 11 goals out of David Kampf and Ilya Labushkin. I think the best news you take out of this game, despite the two points, is Jack Campbell looked really good. And it's been kind of a touch and go conversation with him. Because it's not just about, hey, does Jack look good? It's, hey, Jack, 
how, how you feeling? Bit of a jumpy fan base, and you can forgive us for being a little bit jumpy. Because we like him. We like him. And we, we really want him to be in net for game one. Questions. Not a question, just some quotes that I thought were funny. Keith, the first goal, almost a textbook screen by Labushkin, and he laughs, so I would almost call it two own goals tonight. Sheldon checks Twitter on the bench, confirmed. Number two, Nylander says he told Pierre Engvall at dinner in Ottawa last night how proud he is of his evolution as a player this season. As a Swede, you want to take care of the Swedes. Also of note, Nylander had to ask us to remind him what city they were in last night. That is William Nylander compressed into two tweets. God, I love him. Even though they scored on the power play tonight, are you still concerned about this last little stretch of not producing on the power play? Mm, a little? Not really. Uh, last night, even, in the game against Ottawa, oh my god, I almost just did what William Nylander did, I was looking at the Leafs not scoring on the power play, and I was getting frustrated like the rest of you, but I'm looking at them like, they have six shots through their first two power plays, you know? Like, over this stretch, I didn't actually notice the fact that they hadn't scored in a while until they put the stat up. Because it hasn't felt like it. Last year, it felt like it. It felt like the power play sucked. You know why? Because it did. I just kind of think the puck hasn't really been going in lately. On the power play. They, they've still been winning otherwise. And then they break the slump without Austin Matthews in the lineup. Go figure. I'm not worried about it. They're fine. Should we be reading anything into Willie being on the third line and Blackwell getting promoted over him? Feels kind of... Pointed. No, no, I wouldn't read into that. William Nylander got the game-winning goal in this one. Pierre Engvall got the game-tying goal, and David Kampf got the game-sealing goal with the empty netter. Those three are a line. Sheldon Keefe loves that line. I, I wouldn't read into that at all. I, I don't think that's a pointed shot at, at Willie. I don't. In fact, on top of William Nylander leading all Leafs in shots in this one with six, he actually had the third most ice time among all Leaf forwards. John Tavares was first, Mitch Marner was second, William Nylander at just under 19 minutes was third. I wouldn't read into it. We'll end with Rob. Shout out to Rob. Hooray for Rob. 106 points, still only second in the division. Pain or pain? You know what? It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. I'll tell you why it's fine. Everything went great last season. Everything. Everything went the Leafs' way. They won the division. And then what happened? The Leafs need something to be a little grumpy about. I'll go a step further. This team and this fan base cannot be in a position where they have 100% confidence because neither of us, the team or the fans, know what to do with it. It's not Good for us! I think the Leafs and their fans are at their best when someone says, hey, are the Leafs good? And the answer is yes, comma, swear word. Having 106 points so far, because they're probably gonna get more, and still only finishing second. <laughs> they might not even finish second. Yeah, that's, that's yes, comma, swear. A bad word. So, that is it for this one. Thank you very much for watching. Click like if you like this video. Click subscribe if you really liked it. Tell your friends Happy Easter, Buena Pasqua, and also, brand new Steve Dangle podcast tomorrow.